Uh, a bit of an interesting week for me, but um, when Lee sent that thing through in the morning, I don't know if you're getting the morning text or anything, if you're not, you should be, it's a great encouragement normally and all that sort of things, you see C and I see Lee and um, they're giving me gear and, and he'll put you on the list. Um, but we, I showed you the clip last week from the ACL about the LGBTIQ conversion therapy and what they passed as far as making scripture reading, praying, uh, uh, <laughs> a criminal offence with uh, up to eight years. Uh, but they've just passed, according to Lee there, and buried in uh, Queensland Health legislation. They've now passed that if any group um, or person uh, tries to convert a homosexual person, uh, then you could be spending a jail that makes a criminal sentence. That So if someone comes through this morning that's of a transgender or a homosexual type thing and I say to them, you can be free of that lifestyle, Jesus Christ can set you free so that you can avoid all the diseases that come with a homosexual lifestyle. God doesn't intend for you to be that way. He didn't make you that way. There's hope for you to be free of that thing in Jesus' name. If I say that to them, then I'll be occupying the new and improved Etna Creek facilities out there <laughs> under legislation that they passed. You know, it's funny to laugh, but it's wicked, is what it is, where it's okay for them to uh, prosecute you and do whatever you like. But I said to Jazz, it's a matter of time before I end up out there or something, you know what I mean, with what's on the website. And, um, and if you really want to help somebody that's crying out in that way, that is now a criminal offence as of today. And so if you say to someone, you, you try and offer them hope in Jesus' name, then that's where you'll end up, in a bed next to Rocco. And then you might have some practical experience about homosexuality out in the prison system, you know? So uh, uh, let's, let's not try and dwell on that. So I, I've gone with... Uh, because something happened during the week that really is like, I know the, spirit, the, the scripture that says the spirit went out of them. You know what I mean? And my hope for this country disappeared throughout the week. I honestly believe, I don't know, I don't, I'm not saying this for you to do or whatever, but in my, I will not pray for revival in Australia from this point on. In me, my, that has turned we are given over to judgment. I believe for, for, that's what God said to Jeremiah. And for me, this country has become so wicked and against God that the only thing that can reform it is the judgment of God. I mean, that's what God loved uh, Judah, loved Israel, but the only thing that could reform them was the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. And when the prophet Amos heard that that was God's plan, he's crying out, God, do something. Nothing, you're doing nothing. Do something, God. God says, don't worry. I've got it in hand. The Babylonians are coming. Then Amos began to freak out. What are you doing, God? That can't possibly be the rescue plan because the Babylonians had a scorched earth policy. They come through, they burn every tree, they kill everything in its path. And you know, so Amos is saying that, possibly, that can't possibly be God's rescue plan for his people. And yet that was exactly what God's rescue plan was for his people. And so I'm, like I say, I'm not saying for you, and if you feel in God to do it, pray earnestly. But for me, the spirit of God left me for this, for Australia. I just think, we're in times of judgment. If they are openly, not openly, if they're secretly legislating this stuff buried in Section 6, Part 11 of a Health Act, and if you think our politicians are so 
uh, adept that they're reading all this stuff to find these little bits that are buried in there, you're kidding yourself. They keep them that busy running all over the countryside, spending their credit card and their travel things and, and doing whatever they got to do. And uh, they're running from this function to another function. They're reading nothing. A bureaucrat is burying this stuff in there and that's what's going on. They're passing these things and being just all happening under COVID and COVID. All we're hearing is COVID and COVID and COVID. But what's the real agenda? Well, the real agenda has been around the globe to murder more babies and to have us uh, in jail for praying, for scripture reading, for having a, an opinion that's different from any uh, of the conventional flow that's going on. So it's wicked is how I feel about it. Romans, uh, we'll start the book of Romans 1. Um, may as well get on the tape early, that way if anyone sees it, they can put me in jail early. Romans 1, 28. Um, and, and in this case, it, he's starting off God, and he says in Romans 1, 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, that is where Australia is at. We don't want God in the schools. We don't want God in the courts. We don't want God in any public places. God is an embarrassment to Australians. We need to move that totally from the public sphere. I'm not talking about individual Australians. I'm talking about Australia collectively. However, on the flip side of that, we've got a Mardi Gras going on. Woo! Celebrate good times. Come on, woo! <laughs> We want to celebrate that openly and publicly. In fact, we've got half-naked men walking around and people bringing their kids to see it. Yeah. Woo-hoo! That's a peep show when I grew up. You understand what I said? That's pornography. When you're taking children to see half-naked things, that was pornography. That was my little dirty little secret hidden in the magazines and things like that. That was a peep show. Now you've got parents. Woo! Yeah, you go. But my goodness... We bring them to church, that's evil. That's evil. It's wicked. Here we go. So they don't retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a debased mind. And that's where I think we're at. I think God is giving Australia over to a debased mind. We've lost sanity. We're drinking the cup of madness is what the Old Testament says. Our, our leaders are drinking the cup of madness. I'm seeing more and more systems, whether it's the health system, whether it's the prison system, you may not know it at the moment, but it, what's happening in the prison system is they've given a two-year amnesty for, uh, for felons to make any accusation they like against uh, war, uh, over the screws. And so these prisoners are laying at night thinking, OK, well, Joe's been really bad to me and I know he, he shafted me, I didn't get the, the, the parole, I didn't get my meal that I wanted. Well, what can we do about Joe? And so just locally there's been seven officers that have been, they, they had a week-long inquisition in which the federal police came up and they're under investigation. There's no evidence. But these prisoners have made accusations and therefore we must follow it through. And one of them came in so broken after 30 years in the system, he said, I can't go back to it. His career is over. If these guys want to defend themselves, it's going to cost them $50,000 of their own money. Prisoners get legal aid and all the psychology and all the support they need and all the time. They, the system is broken. Wicked. You've got school systems that are completely debased in which we're teaching our three and four-year-olds you don't know whether you're a boy or a girl. You need to choose. Hello, the choice has already been made in your chromosomes, okay? It's already there as to what the choice is. You need to learn to be what God made you to be, is what you need to be. And we wonder why we've got confusion in this realm. But what's happening in Australia? God is giving them over to a debased mind. You don't want God? God says, no problem, I'll give you over to a debased mind. And so we've got good and uh, we've got politicians that I'm sure they mean well, but what's the fruit of what's coming out? Debauchery, a debased mind is what's coming out. And I don't care if it's the health system or what system it is, there's insanity within the system. People are saying behind doors, this is what's going on. I never thought it would come to this. You know, rough and tough railway workers that were, had, you know, all pornography up in the sheds. Well, that's all gone. They're all wearing rainbow colours now, celebrating Gay Day and things like that, Rainbow Day. And they, all of them are in it. They've all got to do it. You want to keep your job, you do that. There's insanity throughout the whole system is what's going on. It doesn't stand. We've got a system that graduates out of our, out of our school kids. One third out of 12 years of education 
one third of the students that graduate that cannot read and write properly. What sort of system are they generating? Are you kidding me? Is the, the amount of money that goes into that thing, if I gave you a million dollars to educate 30 kids, how would you go? You'd probably go all right, wouldn't you? Hey, plenty of support there. It's not from lack of teachers. It's not from lack of teachers' aides. It's not from lack of resources. Don't kid yourself. It's from these kids that know nothing can be done to me. And so they're making veiled threats to teachers. You wouldn't want me to feel left out, would you, miss? Because otherwise you are under discrimination legislation and off we go. There's teachers out there that are frightened to lose their credentials because of things that are happening within the school system. These kids are working that system. And you hear it all the way through from school, all the way through the prison system. These people are rebellious. They, have, they will not have anyone to rule over them, is what they're saying, okay? And Jesus said these words, well, not Jesus, but God said it. He said, choose you this day, life and death. And Australia has said, I'll choose death, thanks, because we despise God. <coughs> That's where they're at. Anyway, so 28, in knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, not just homosexuality, sexual immorality. We've got... Yeah, young, you're a couple of years away, Lloyd. I tell you what the pressure is. Every man and his dog's out there going to be sleeping with everybody. I had a mate of mine from school. He lost his missus two years ago. He showed me this website. He said, well, yeah, all my mates have been telling me, get on here. Mate, you want to see the debauchery that's on there. Any night of any week, you could be out there, and these women are basically hookers with no money. I don't know what, how stupid people are, but you go out and you're in their home alone, or they're in your home alone, What's the chance of domestic violence and abuse going off there? And any night of the week, he said, mate, I could have six a night off this thing. That's what's going on out there. It's the old 70s swingers days. Only on steroids is what's going on. And God's giving them over to this, sexual immorality. And so the pressure's going to be on you, Lloyd, because all your mates are going to be out there in the club saying, come on, mate, woo! Yeah, it's all right, go to church on Sunday, but yeah, in the meantime, woo! God says, no, 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 that's sexual immorality. That's evil in my eyes. But the culture says it's not evil. And if you stifle that, you're going to do psychological damage to these kids. That's evil. That's evil. God says one thing, they say another thing. Exactly. So, so we start with sexual immorality, which is where we went in the 70s. Wickedness, covetousness. Do you know covetousness? Let's just talk about that for, for an instance. Do you know, they haven't advertised this statistic, but locally, youth crime has gone up 2,000% on last year. 2,000%. If you haven't had your car knocked off, mate, it's coming. So don't leave the keys or wallet or phone in there because, mate, it's coming. You know, these, and they're all little fellas. 13, 12, 13, I had a client of mine got this brand new Land Cruiser, right? 90 grand, mine ready, all the rops on it and all this sort of stuff. He's got that, he bought his wife a new car to do that. I mean, stupid thing to do financially, but anyway, they're into it. You know, they just spent $130,000 on cars. You know what happened? They drove them into the driveway, all good, got inside. Woo! Oh, darling, I have the smell of the new car. And as they're in there, oh, what's happening? These little 13 and 14 year olds are just taking the car. Walked in, grabbed the keys off the kitchen, taking the two cars and drove them round for about three hours. And then what they do, they said, oh, we had some fun. We'll let it go, will we? That's what happened in the old days. What happened these days? They drove them off the cliff. <gasps> totally written off, gone. So we've got all sorts of things going on here. Maliciousness, covetousness. These kids are not qualified to get their own, so they get it the way the street people get it. They're in gangs and they're organised and they're not smart, but they're street smart. They know how to work it, so that's where they are. And what does the court system say? Well, why don't you get 50 hours community service, little Johnny, because after all, we don't want to put you in the prison system because you won't get rehabilitated there. Hello, he won't because it's a 96% retention rate in the prison system. 100 go in and 96 come back after they're finished. You've only got four that won't come back. That's the wrong prison system, don't you think? And no wonder, because, mate, in those cells... I had the Tyler that's working out there, he came and saw me, he said, mate, it's like the Hilton. He said, you've got the shower cubicle, you've got your own bed, you've got the TV inside here, you've got air conditioning going on. Mate, I tell you what, some of us aren't living that good. 
I was always worried about the shower duties, dropping the soap and all that sort of stuff. But mate, if you got your own shower, what do you do? You know what I mean? You're in there studying life away. This is what. No wonder they don't want to go out there. Where's the cracking rocks? Where's the pulling lantana out of the out of the uh, river systems and things like that? Where's the hard graft? Where? No, no, they've got drugs in there. Don't worry about that. They've got all sorts of things. It's life at the Hilton. The company may not be great, but you know what I mean. Uh, you don't want to do the wrong thing. You'll get bashed within an inch of your life. That's the facts, but if you know the system, prison can be all right for some. They break in to get out. But one guy came up to parole, this one of these prison guys told me this, and uh, he came up to parole and they said, well, uh, the social worker told me this, and because they, they rang him and said, listen, we've got to try and get your support system worked out for when you come out of prison. And so what we're going to try and do is we're going to get, you know, we'll get you some housing, we'll try and get you some part-time job, we'll get all that. She, and he said, don't bother. He said, as soon as I get out of here, they're trying to kick me out of here. As soon as I get out of here, I'm going to commit another crime so I can get back in here. And that's how they're going. The system is broken. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So the judgment of God is already falling. And what's going to happen is it's going to wax worse and worse and worse. As these kids come out, these rebellious cows that won't have any authority under any teacher, that, that are threatening teachers, that are making up lies and being believed by the system and know that they can manipulate the system to put those in authority in precarious posi positions. They learn that early and then they come in. When you've got, you've got preppies coming in calling teachers filthy names and with no repercussions on that, what sort of system are you going to have after 12 years of education? So Australia, we're on the brink. We're at the brink, we're probably past the brink. What happens, we're gonna have covetous maliciousness, full of envy, that's where they are. They want what you got. They don't wanna do the hard yards to get what you got, but they want what you've got. Then it goes on, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. See how it progresses worse and worse and worse. Violent, proud, they're not, they're not humble or they're not embarrassed by their deeds. <laughs> they think, look what I did. How I got a, It's a badge of honour. Look what I did. I took ice for three weeks and I'm okay. Look at me, I'm still holding the job. Woo! They're not embarrassed by it. They're proud. Look how I'm, I'm in control here. Okay, inventors of evil things. They're going to come up with things that you've never even thought about. They're laying like those prisoners in jail. How do we get Wally? Because, uh, you know, I don't like Wally as a water, so what are we going to accuse Wally of? They invent things of evil, is what they, they come up with things out of the blue. Here's another one disobedient to parents, okay? Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Are we this? You've got to check yourself. This is the spirit of our age. We need to run this checklist through our own lives because the spirit of this age, the culture of Australia, is what we're reading. And so we need to run through, are we, are we uh, undiscerning? Kids, are we disobedient to parents? Oh, we've got the sly thing going on. Here's a word to parents. Something, uh, Matthew's not here, but I'll tell you this. God chipped me about three months ago. He said that the spirit of this age is disobedience and rebelliousness in our children. And we need to command obedience in our children. They need to learn obedience. Jesus learned things by the things that he suffered. And so what we have in this is a real forgiving, all oh, lovey-dovey. And listen, none of this works without love. Your child needs to know that you love them. And the balance, the problem I've got at the moment is I've got no time. So I'm working six days a week, 11 hours a day for those things. I don't have the time, so I, I don't discipline real heavy at the moment because without love, discipline will cause rebellion. So they need to know that you love them first, then when you're hard, they can hear what you're saying because they know you've got the best interests in. So just a word to the wise, like at the moment I back off, but I want to tell you that God said to me, you've got to pull him up more. He needs to hear, because I noticed in my child, there's not a hearing of the parent's voice. You're saying three and four times, he's running around, he's doing his own thing. The spirit of disobedience is in our children because it's the spirit of the age. And it's our job to drive that out as parents. They need to hear a voice and respond to that voice. But that is contrary to everything that's in the system. 
in the school, they don't hear the voice. There's no repercussions on that voice. No one's getting the cane these days. Who got the cane when they were at school? Hello? We're all here. In fact, we're in church. Who knew? Who knew? Who's working and worked for a living? They got the strap. Hello? No psychological damage there. We're all okay. Hello? Even some people who went to the convent and got the hell beaten out of them, they are still okay. Hello? We've got kids who ne nothing falls on them. When it gets all too hot, they run off to the psychologist and get a little report, and the whole, whole system has to change around that child. Well, that's not real and that's not sustainable. That's, that's, that doesn't work in a workplace uh, in reality, in the real world. We are destroying our kids' hope of any future because we set them up with an unreal reality in school. It starts early. In fact, it starts in prep. And even before, some of the kids' shows that are on TV are already training them in the ways of rebellion. Pe to be a parent in this time in history is awfully difficult. You don't take it for granted that your children are going to be uh, little God because they grew up in church because they heard all these sermons, they're going to be lovely Christians. No, that's not the case at all because they're great actors, they're great deceivers, they're great manipulators. Children are born like that. And in the spirit of the age that we're in here, God says they're disobedient to parents. It's up to us to be proactive so that they hear the Father's voice. Ultimately, the time comes where we stop and they hear the Father's voice, my sheep hear my voice. Not my sheep do my own thing. My sheep hear my voice. But for a child, we stand in God's position. They must hear our voice until the time of maturity, then they hear his voice. If they're not hearing our voice now, as my child was, I've got to be honest, in him is a streak that runs against, you know what I mean? We'll buck and we'll try and manipulate and get their own way. He's his father's son, that's all I'll say. <laughs> that's all I'll say. Master manipulator, I thought I was anyway. And, it, and so that comes naturally. What doesn't come naturally is obedience, but that's what's needed in this generation, okay? God's saying they're disobedient to parents right here. Okay. Haters of God, backbiters, inventors, disobedient parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Is that us? Are we untrustworthy? Someone gives us a secret. Do we run around with that? That's untrustworthy. We can't trust that person. Are they unloving? Are you unloving? We've got to go through this checklist. Are we unforgiving? Someone, okay, I love everybody until they cross me, and then they cross me, that's the end of that. <laughs> hey? Where's that coming from? That's coming from the pit of hell. That's come from the pit of hell. Because forgiveness, those who have been forgiven much, forgive much. And I guarantee you this, nobody sitting here, nobody sitting here has not been forgiven much. We just don't know that we have been, haven't been forgiven much. You know what I mean? We're, God wakes us up to these things. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice us things are what? deserving of death. Of all these things in this thing that God has listed here, people who practice these things, who live according to these things, are worthy in God's sight of death. And I want to tell you these things are running rampant in Australia. I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Today, is, I, I want to preach a, a, a series, maybe of three sermons here. I just want to, in case I go to jail, quick, I don't know. I'll just say, a survival pack for Babylon is what I'm saying because the church is getting carried away into Babylon is where we're going and so I want a, a little thing out there where anybody who's coming new can come and get um, up to speed as quickly as possible so I figure that's important at now so we'll just do maybe three and then we'll go on to some uh, heart messages I want to do but I just want to get this out of the way and publish so that anybody who if something happens, you know what I mean? That there's, there's a resource there that somebody can get and get up to speed uh, is what we're looking at. So we go to Isaiah chapter 5 and, uh, and verse 20. So, sorry, can someone let me know when it's quarter past 11? That way, because I'll just chop this wherever we're at, you know. Uh, Isaiah 5 and verse 20. And this is what Isaiah's cry is in the day as they're getting carried away to Babylon, okay? Jeremiah gets carried away to Babylon. Isaiah stays in Judah. At the, so the two of them run together talking about the same event from two different perspectives. 
But Isaiah has an eye view on what's going on at home base in Judah, okay? And what's he saying? He's saying this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Okay, let's just write some things down. They call evil good and then good evil. What's the next one? Can someone read it out to me? They call darkness light. Is that right? Darkness. They call it light. And then light they call darkness. And then there's another one. Keep reading for me, Joe. Uh, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Good on you, Dale. Thank you. Sweet. So when we start, this is the progression of God, right? We know we're along this path now, okay? The judgment of God has started. Why do we know that? Because when we first start, good begins to be called evil, okay? Evil, sorry, begins to become good. So things like, uh, you know, that he's talking about homosexuality, corruption, you know, people used to actually leave their ministries when they were found corrupt. Now they just sort of say, oh, well, so sorry, and, you know, I'm refusing to leave my seat and all that sort of stuff. And, and who isn't corrupt, by the way? We watched a movie last night about a corruption in the UK uh, that started in 2002. And, mate, they murdered people and all sorts of things. True story. And, mate, they're all still in power. And, of course, the police force was highly involved. Uh, surprise, surprise. And how many corruption inquiries have we had in Queensland? <laughs> and, mate, they've all been found, 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 and if you think you've, you're out of it, you've got it routed out now, you're kidding yourself. It's, the system is broken, okay? That's what I'm trying to tell you. But anyway, what was evil? They say, no, it's not evil. It's good. But the time comes after the first phase where they inevitably... As soon as you start, if you accept that what is evil is good, inevitably the second thing is that what is good becomes evil. And that's where we are at the moment. See, we, they've taken on all the things that the Bible says, that God says is an abomination, all the things that he hates, and they say, well, no, they're good. They're good. They're, all that stuff is good. And so inevitably what ends up happening is what we've got going now, where that which God calls good, his word a faithful Christian life, a faithful marriage between a man and a woman, a, a family that endeavours to bring their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, they say you're warping their minds, that you're not fit to be a parent and therefore we have to probably take your kids off you. There was some legislation proposed like that, that those people who bring their kids up like that have a, a psychological disorder and they need to be re-educated. Hello, Mao, Communist Russia. That's where it's at. So we're at this stage. We're no longer at stage one here. We're at stage two where good is called evil. Okay? We start with stage one, but we're past it. That's why I think God is done with us. Now, I think Australia is done for because at this stage, Isaiah is saying this when there's no hope left for Judah. He's saying, woe to those who do this. And we're at here. Then they get darkness, things that would be done shamefully, shameful things that are a disgrace to anybody of a normal mind. And they say, no, no, darkness is good. Therefore, we will have the Mardi Gras. And we want everyone in there, despite the fact that there's an explosion of se sexual diseases out there that occur after that and go throughout our, our, um, our society, or at least the danger of that. Okay? But we have all this thing, no problem. Don't worry about AIDS, no problem with that. We just let the thing go. And so, and things that would be done in darkness, like fornication, remember? Yeah, you used to have to drive in a car and stay out at night. I had a guy in there and they didn't come back. He brought the, brought the, uh, the lady back uh, for five o'clock in the morning because she was staying with the grandparents. They've been out all night doing what they do, you know what I mean? And so things that would be done in darkness, shameful, they're not shameful anymore, that's just normal. That's how we do things. You know what I mean? That's normal for a young person. If you're not out there sowing your oats on everything, mate, there's something wrong with you. What's wrong with you? Are you a man or what are you? You know what I mean? That's how they think. That's dark. Darkness is called light. And then they flip the coin. And then anything that's light, 
then becomes not just inconvenient. God's not using terms like, you know, this is embarrassing or it's slightly inappropriate. They will paint something that God calls good and they call it evil. They call it darkness. You know, we spoke last, last week about darkness. Satanic, demonic things. That's how they will view Christianity. Because they call it darkness, which God calls light. Okay? Okay. When we look at bitter and sweet, God's making it very clear here because he's itemizing down what ultimately will happen. And that is that the bitter becomes sweet to them and the sweet becomes bitter. Well, let's start with sweet. Let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 109. Psalm 109. Okay. Oh, sorry, 119. Let's go there. So I might have got the wrong one. It's a big long psalm, this one. Uh, where are we? Okay, let, look at this one. Psalm 119 and verse 103. It says, How sweet are your words in my taste. Sweet is the word. Okay, that's what sweet is. But look, let's turn to Acts chapter 8. So just after the Gospels, Acts chapter 8 and verse 23. And it says, For, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Bitterness is iniquity and sweetness is the word of God. And they are calling what's iniquity, what is sinful, what is shameful, what is evil, what is darkness in God's definitions. And they're saying, no, that's as pure to me as the word of God. And then they're saying what the word of God is, is sinful and abounding in, in iniquity is what it is. You're in a bondage of iniquity. If you follow the word of God, you're abound in iniquity. Isn't that what society is saying to them? No, they're not just saying that it's... Um, Oh, you know, really, you're a lot of uh, people who are paranoid and really you've got such a misunderstanding socially and it's really disappointing that you people uh, are like that. You know what I mean? You should If you were highly educated like us, then, mate, then, you know, you would see the light, but I know that you're, you're hoodwinked, but, that, you know, whatever. No, they don't say that. What they say is, okay, if you propagate this, we're going to put you in jail. And so for them... What is pure in God's sight becomes iniquity for them. It becomes darkness. It becomes evil. And that's what Isaiah said to Judah. You said, well, surely that's not the church. It is some churches as well, I'd have to say. You know, uh, what's going on out there. There is some of that in, in churches as well. And you've got to remember that Isaiah was talking to Judah, his own people. And possibly God's looking at the churches saying, there's churches out there that are ordaining homosexuals not just having them in the congregations but ordaining them as ministers there's people out there that are not telling their young people not to fornicate uh, so what are they doing they're exchanging what God gave as light as a protection to these young people for God forbid all the sexual diseases that are out there because of all this rampant stuff that's going on I had one young fella uh, that he, he said um, just texting that girl last night I said yeah what's that, that for he said well I just want to make sure she's okay because I don't want any parts of my body falling off so they know that even the dangers are out there, but it doesn't stop them, you know what I mean? What's going on? So um, they do all this. It's, it's insane. We're in the asylum. Okay, let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah. And 2, verse 13, we'll go to. Jeremiah picks up the same theme. And it says, my people, right? He's, he's focusing in on not on the world or Babylon, He's talking about the church here. Okay? My people, he's not talking about the church, he's talking about his own people, but God in this day overlaying it for this time, if our, if, you know, the theme is that in Revelation, Babylon the great, that great harlot, and Babylon is fallen, the theme will recur in the last days as the same. If you want to study what happens in the last day, study Isaiah, study, study Jeremiah, what happened when they were taken into Babylon, that, that will recur again. And the, and the church that is not the real church is right now on the road to Babylon. Okay? So uh, he's saying this, 
13, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Okay, first of all, they forsake God. Here's their thing. So we, we, we know what God's word is, but we let that go. We just let that go for a bit. But then what comes closely after that, he says, that, and the second evil is that they've hewn out for themselves cisterns. Okay, we, we're, we're going to house something that looks like it holds God. He said, we get this cistern going, but it doesn't hold any water. Jesus said, I am the living water. And so we've got all these structures out there, Jeremiah's saying, that look like they're the church, that look like they're doing the right thing, but really they're empty vessels. They're corrupt inside. They're broken. There's nothing of the Spirit of God. They think there's a Spirit of God. They've got atmosphere. They've got entertainment. They've got lights, camera, action. But where's God? No, no, they've hewn out for themselves a cistern that looks, feels, tastes, sounds like God, but they've forsaken God at the start. They, the Word of God is too abrupt to them. They won't speak the Word of God. If you had to speak about homosexuality, you'll never hear it in these churches. It's too confrontational to the spirit of this age. If you have to talk about suffering for Christ, oh, that's too confrontational and too down, it's too negative. We never talk about that in church. What have they done? They've substituted God's Word and made their own cistern that sounds good. Oh, you don't have to suffer. You can be rich. You just have to give and it's going to be given a hundredfold back to you. And, you know, you can have the Maserati that you always wanted. And what about, and really, if you're a success in Christ, you need a big whopping house and a swimming pool and movie stars. That's what you need because, if, after all, if God is for you, who can be against you? And therefore, you should be loaded, people. And Jesus, the master who we're supposed to follow, says, foxes have holes. But I don't have anywhere to lay my head tonight. Hello. The apostle Paul, the greatest of all apostles, <laughs> chief of apostles. He says, I've been in nakedness. Oh, that's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? Couldn't even get enough money to scratch around some clothes. Eh? I've been in persecutions. I've been in famines. I've, I know how to abase and abound. One th I thought it was all success. success. They have substituted the word of God for a system that sounds so good, but it can't hold any water. They keep pouring it in. Oh, look at the, the spirits out poured. Woohoo! And you look in their side and you say, where is it? <laughs> Hello? But they'll tell you that it's light. But what the church has done is we're substituting bitter for sweet. And what they end up with is iniquity sitting underneath because they're rebellious to the word of God that's been given because it's inconvenient. to. The, anyway, let's go to verse 18. It says, And now why take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Sihor? Or why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Your own wickedness will correct you. Your backslidings will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing. Same themes as what we've got going in Isaiah. That you have forsaken the Lord your God. And the fear of me is not in you. You know what's missing from the church today? The fear of God. You know what God is? He's a bro, baby. He's a bro. He's my bro upstairs. Yeah. Woo! The man upstairs. Woo! That's who he is. Bible never speaks in those terms. He says he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's as casual as you get. But also you must remember of Jesus, not only he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, but he's the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. And when he comes back in the book of Revelations, he's not saying, hey, bro, I'm back in the hood. He's saying... I am the King of kings and Lord of lords and I'm here to avenge blood on the wickedness that's gone on the earth. And so we need to be careful. He is a friend. That's still, I'm not trying to diminish that, but the problem is the church has gone all friendly, friendly with no fear of God or the judgment of God falling. And so that's where they are. They've forsaken the Lord. The fear of the Lord's not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds and you said I will not transgress when on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. These churches, they lay, they say, I'm, I'm not going to transgress. I'm not a sinner. I've never sinned. I've heard some preachers say that. Oh, I've never sinned. The Bible says you say that you're a liar. They say, yeah, I've never sinned. Oh, they've got a weird concept of righteousness of God. But anyway, here we are, never sinned. That's what they say, but he says all the time they're laying down with a harlot. That's what's going on. So these things are interesting anyway. So uh, the main thing is that the same themes are in their business. Let's go to Ephesians. It's not just in the Old Testament. Let's have a look. Ephesians 4. 
Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Listen to the words here. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. These people who he's talking to are sealed for the day of redemption. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. These are people of God he's talking to. They've got maliciousness on their lips. Okay? Anger, clamor, evil speaking. He says, God says, get it out. Okay, and listen, this is what's to replace it. You don't just kick something out, you've got to put something in. Okay, you don't just get rid of sin. I tell you what, you do that, it just comes back or something else fills its place. We need to be filling that first. You expel a demon is what the Bible says, and if you don't clean the house, there's seven more come back. So you don't just get him out because that does nothing. You've got to get him out and replace it with something is what's going on. This is a, a common, common theme in scripture. And so what are we replacing it with? Well, we have bitterness. We have wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. And God says this, simple. Listen to these words. Be kind to one another. That's real theological, isn't it? Hey? Just be kind. Can you be kind to your spouse? Can you be kind to each other in the fellowship here, the family of God that God's put you in? Or have we got malicious lips? Or are we unforgiving? Are we angry people? We need forgiveness in our hearts. Tender hearted. Soft hearts. You know, the, the danger of everything that we're heading into here is that you get so hard that you become unfeeling. Because you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to get, you know, you, you're you're going to be vilified, you're going to be in all sorts of strife socially, you say, well, I'll just get hard to it, you know what I mean? So they can't get in. But God says, be tender-hearted. Be tender-hearted. To such an extent that, you know, Jesus was able to say, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And that's what we'd have to say of this generation. They don't know what they're sowing into the wind. They're going to reap a whirlwind, but they don't know what they're doing. They think what they're doing is right. But they're completely misled, of course, I believe. So we've got that. We've got forgiving one another. Listen, offense, it's impossible that offenses won't come. <laughs> people are people, eh? You know? Offenses are going to come. Someone's going to say something, do something that's going to hurt your feelings. Someone's going to do something malicious to you. They speak behind your back. They talk about you. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. You know what God says? Keep a tender heart. Keep a tender heart and be forgiving of one another. He, and he says, listen, and do it, why? Because Christ forgave you. Do you want the forgiveness of God or are you going to be riding a high horse? They don't understand. They don't know like I know. God says, forgive them because I forgave you. That's the reason we forgive. Other than that, we don't. Okay, won't turn to it, but let's, let's have a look at this. We'll just do... Yeah, okay, we'll get a little bit of section on. Hebrews chapter 12. We're there. May as well get, go to Hebrews. We're just about there. So Hebrews chapter 12. You go forward towards the book of Revelation, you'll find it. Hebrews 12 and verse 12. It says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down, the feeble knees, which make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. And listen to this, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Listen to this, the same words. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. What's going on in the church of God? Same thing. God says, I want peace in the house of God. We strive for peace in our lives. We strive for peace in our marriages. We strive for peace in our workplaces. We strive for peace with our neighbors who are unsaved, many of them. We strive to live a peaceable life is what we're striving for. That's what God wants. But... Instead of it, he said, you don't do that, you're going to have a root of bitterness that springs up and it causes trouble. And not only does it defile you, but it defiles other people. Okay? What you do affects everybody in your sphere of influence. 
And so we've got to strive in God to be a person of peace. Okay? Where it's possible. This is not... Like I said, I'm not dealing with high theological things here. God says, be kind. Be tender-hearted. Forgive one another. That's not beyond a five-year-old. And yet, what do we see in the church of God? You've got running battles on YouTube about theological issues that are fairly minor and going on there, and they're doing it in a public space. Why not write the guy or gas for his email address and battle it out and see if he can be reconciled, rather than putting it on the, on, on the world stage so that every unbeliever and new Christian can get on and just get, get absolutely confirmed in their thing that you Christians can't agree on anything yourselves. You know what I mean? So why should I stick with this? Because the, the language that ultimately gets used is backbiting, malicious language is what ends up in there. Where is the kindness? Where is the tenderness of heart? Where is the forgiveness? Where is, in between brothers in Christ, the ability to say, listen, I'm going to let you have the last comment about me on YouTube or Instagram, whatever you want to call it, and... I know that you've uh, been malicious against me and I'm going to let it go like that. And I'll let you have the last word. You'll go onto some of my clips on, you, on YouTube and you'll see comments down there. And some of the comments uh, bang up against me. You'll notice one thing. I never respond. I don't need to defend myself. I stand behind the shadow of the Almighty. And no arrow that comes to me in the night will get through. No arrow will get to me unless Jesus lets it come through. And he'll do that sometimes to humble me. And that's fine. i got no problem. Someone sees something different to me, good on you. No problem. As long as it's not foundational, and then we can't have fellowship with you then. But as long as you, you know, you can, there's a wide range of views out there. But I don't bite back. Even though people bite me, I don't bite back. Because why would you? You don't win that way. Some of them, you could smash them. And I could use the same vitriol that's out there, which some of these guys are using against one another, and I'm saying, what good does that do the body of Christ? What does that edify anybody? And so we need to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving of one another. These are not highfalutin ideas. These are living out good doctrine. You don't have that, you don't have good doctrine. Simple as that. Simple as that. Okay, listen, we'll just do one thing and then we'll finish. Why? A lot of people are saying, I, I had a book out there, I haven't read it yet, but I was thinking about getting it, and it's called This is the End Times Again. <laughs> Because the reason why they say that, and there's been many instances, probably started initially with, uh, uh, and I'll probably spell this wrong, but Vesuvius, where Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii went off, bang, and the, and the clouds, it blocked out the sun for a number of days, and people thought, this is the book of Revelation that's occurring. And at the time, they had, uh, the, the, the emperor of Rome was uh, persecuting Christians, uh, they were you know, putting in the agoras, they had things where you had to confess that Caesar is Lord in order to buy from the marketplaces. They said, this is the mark of the beast. They had it all lined out, but it wasn't the end times. But it was a good picture of the end times. Then we had another one where we have uh, uh, Napoleon, who unites Europe, okay? This anti, it was a picture of the Antichrist, and he made a European confederation, and off he begins to conquer here and there. And there's so many things at that time that lined up with the end times revelations. And they said, well, surely this is Jesus' is coming. No. Then we have another one. Hitler comes along. He starts writing numbers on Jews' arms. 
He starts conquering Europe and uniting Europe, countries that were never confederated before. He's expansionist. He's talking about a thousand-year kingdom, so the millennium type thing. He's, he's projecting himself. He's obviously demonically animated and all this sort of charismatic. He fits the mold as the Antichrist. Woo! Jesus is coming. But he's not coming. These are pictures of what was coming. <laughs> down the line. So why is it, why would we be saying, Paul, you're saying, why is today so different? Why do you see it so different as all of that? Well, let's have a look in 2 Peter chapter 3. I've got 10 minutes because I don't want to keep you long with these ones. So 2 Peter, and I have, I apologize because I know I have been preaching long. So I've got to wind that back in. So, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, I think it is. Okay, in the midst of, he's talking about, the, the, the passages before that is talking about Mo, uh, Noah and the destruction that God brings, the judgment of God falling, okay? And in the midst of it, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. Okay? One day is as a thousand years with the Lord. And a thousand years equals one day. So now, this passage is directly linked with prophetic things about the judgment of God. And Second Peter is saying this, when we come to apocalyptic literature, we look at this, this, you can't apply this across the board. Okay, you go to the prophecy of Daniel 9, 27, you're not applying a thousand years as one day or anything like that in those instances. But Second Peter says when it comes to apocalyptic literature, this rule can apply, okay? With the Lord, Thousand years is as one day. Okay, so when we have a look, we, we start in the book of Joshua. Let's do that one. Some of you will know all these, so don't, don't panic. You sit there, you can sleep during this one. Um, here we go. Joshua chapter 3, I think it is. Uh, what's it? 3. Oh, it could be early on in the chapter 2. Um, no, 3 verse 4, I think it is. So what we've got here is a picture of Joshua before he goes into the promised land, okay, is where they're going. And so to do that, they're going to cross over the River Jordan is what we're talking about. And what they do is they send this ark along, right? The ark goes out in front of them. And they remember the river goes, and so the ark goes over. But there's a distance between the ark crossing over. And we remember, we get from the Apostle Paul that when we cross over the River Jordan, it's a picture of our death. Okay, and moving into the promised land is like our resurrection is what we're talking about. That's what the Apostle Paul links it to for, for Jesus' side of things. He uses that as a metaphor. And so what we have here in, in, the, in Joshua 3, 4 is we've got the ark of God. Now, who would you, who's the ark of God? Absolutely is. You've got shit and wood in there by eternal gold, which doesn't rot. So you've got the, the mortality of a man but wrapped in this gold that doesn't perish, the eternal manhood of Jesus, he will forever be a man, is what he is. But indwelling in that is what? The Shekinah glory is what shines in there. The very power and glory of God dwells in that place. That's a picture of Jesus. Now what they're saying is, when Josh, in Joshua 3, 4, they sent the ark over. When it crossed over, there was a distance between that and the people coming over, and it says approximately 2,000 cubits. So if we have Jesus dying, and there'll be, let's just say it's 36 BC, 34, 36, whatever you want, there's different dates, but the crucifixion of Jesus goes somewhere there. Approximately 2,000 cubits after that, 2,030 to 40, something like that, is when the rest of them cross over. That's a picture out of Joshua 3, 4, if we're drawing metaphors here. Okay, then we go to Luke 8, 13, 32. Here's a prophecy that was given that never was ever fulfilled in Jesus' lifetime. 
Okay? Remember our rule in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And so we're going to Luke 13, 32. And it says this. 13, 32. It says, listen. Go and tell that fox, he's talking about her, Behold, today I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. This was never talked about. So if we say in the time of Jesus, if we follow this metaphor, a thousand years, a thousand years, and Jesus says, listen, from the cross, you take this out, there's two days in which I'm going to... People are cessationists. They say, no, all the miracles stopped at the apostles. Well, you'd have a problem with Stephen because he was not an apostle and it said he did great signs and wonders. Okay, so it's not just an apostle gifting. They tell you it's the gift of the apostles. You're kidding yourself. And why would God leave us at the mercy of all the demonic realm that's there with their powers and not give us the power to do what he did, where to do, and greater things will he do, you know? So we've got a thousand years. He says, in those thousand years, today and tomorrow, I'm going to do uh, exercise demons and perform cures. I'm going to do miracles in these two days. Then after that, I'm going to be perfected, okay? So there's two days that come in there. Then, of course, we go through, uh, let's turn to the book of Genesis, and I've got a whole teaching on this. I forget what it's called, but anyway, it's on the, on the website somewhere um, under sermons. Well, I can't remember it. I can see the cover, but I don't know what the sermon name is. Anyway, it doesn't matter anyway. Anyway, we've got the book of Genesis. We've got seven days that are on here, and I don't care what your position is on creation uh, as far as if you be a long earth creationist or whatever you want to do, I don't care. But my thing is that there's no question in my mind that God expects us to understand creation in a six day format. <laughs> okay? So he starts and he goes uh, day one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seventh day is what he's talking about. Okay, so there's a whole picture and there's much deeper than what we're going to go into here, but uh, you can have a look or check me up when I bring my stuff when we get the next visiting speaker and you can have a look at There's a whole teaching on this and there's a lot more things that confirm what we're about to discover here. So then God said, let there be lights in the firmament and the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so then God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and he made the stars also God set them in the firmament of the heavens uh, to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God thought it was good so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So in the fourth day, God makes light. Okay, in there. Now I should say, right from the start, Isaiah 46.10 says this, this is how you'll know I'm God. Not that I've got the eebie-jeebies or I've got this feeling all over me or I can feel him in my hands, I can feel him in my feet, I can feel him everywhere, I can feel him in the air, I can feel him all over me. No, it's nothing to do with that. God says, you'll know I'm God because I tell history before it's ever made. And right in the first book of the Bible, he starts doing that because here we have uh, in the fourth day. Now, while we're on the fourth day, let's turn to the book of John. Uh, book of John. I remember David learning this scripture um, when he was a kid. I doubt whether you'd recall it now, would you, mate? No, nah, that's right. It's funny how things disappear from your head, eh? All right, so, and then Jesus is going on about, this is Jesus, okay? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with all God and God. There was nothing made that wasn't made without Him, and in Him was the life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it there was a man sent from God whose name was John this man came for a witness to bear witness of for the light so we have a great light we have a great light okay where are we up to there uh, okay the man came and that all through him might believe but he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of the light and there was true light which gives light to every man 
coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own did not receive him. And off we go with the book of John. Oh, maybe keep going. And uh, 13, he was born of God, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me was preferred before me. He was before me. And the fullness uh, we have all received and grace for grace. So in, in the book of John, we have two lights. Jesus is that great light that came, the light of men. But we also have John that comes before him. And he was not that light. But he was a reflector to show them to that light. And in day four, we have the same thing. We've got this great light that's put in the heavens which is, of course, our sun. And then by night, we have the moon. I don't know how we want to do that. And the moon reflects the sun of the light. There is no, nothing in the moon that's, that's of any glory, but when the sun shines on it, you look up at night time and you see this brilliant moon up there, and you think, how wonderful is that? It's simply a reflection, reflection of the sun the S-U-N of righteousness. And so on day four, we have this, and it's obviously linked uh, to what we're looking at in John 1, where there's two great lights that are gone on there. The coming of Jesus was, in effect, day four in the book of uh, uh, Genesis. All right, let's go through to Genesis, and then we go back to Genesis chapter 2. Okay, 2. And we're going to read here... Uh, or no, one, sorry, 27. Then, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And what day was that, do you know? Anybody know what day man was created? The number of man is six, and the man of sin being an ultimate fulfillment of man is six, 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 one less than God's complete unit. We're short of a stack, is where we are. We're good at missing the mark. That's where we are. We're made on day six, is what we're looking at. But it's no coincidence when we look at it, say, um, and we just go to chapter two, I think, and early on, yes. Ch two, two. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and um, he rested on the seventh day from his work which he had done. So this is the rest. And if we just take an overall view without digging in too big, we apply this principle when 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says a thousand years is as one day. So the history of man as it would be uh, represented theologically is 7,000 years. <laughs> now if we look at archaeological records, the oldest ones that we seem to carry is the Chinese, that tells us, the Bible tells us this is the history of man, 7,000 years. When we look at the genealogies going back to Adam, you can look at Bishop Usher's work, and it be, might be out a little bit here or there, but it's 7,000 years would be from entirety, well, of the, from where we look at. So from Jesus, 4,000 years, Chinese records to the times of Jesus, then from the times of Jesus, how many days we got? Two days. Day of the Lord is as we got 2,000 years. How do I know that we're in something that's different right now? i tell you how we know, because all these things confirm that two days past the coming of Jesus is where we enter into a rest, which God calls the millennium, a 1,000 years of rest. Okay, one day is 1,000 years. So we've got 1,000 years here. And then everything gets wrapped up. It's all done and dusted, and then we're in the New Jerusalem, and everything's, you know, as it should be. But in the meantime, we've got the millennium, which is a thousand years, and all of these indicate 2,000 years from the coming, from the death of Christ. We've got 2,000 years before he comes and restores his government, and he'll rule on this planet and be a, a, a ruler with a rod of iron. Okay, I'll tell you what, they'll get a few beatings at the start before they get the, the things sorted out. And there'll be places that will be rebellious. It tells you about the millennium that they come, and if they don't come, uh, then they don't get rain for that year. Well, hello, that tells you there's some that don't come. They won't come up to Jerusalem to worship. 
that won't come. And so he will rule with a rod of iron. Do you think he'll get four months in and say, oh, all these poor kids that have to bath out of a bucket now? No, he'll say, I told you, you come up, you're going to be obedient, and you'll get rain. You'll have the blessings if you're obedient. Obedience always brings blessing, which is a word to our kids. They get blessed when they're obedient. If we put up with rebellion, we're sowing seeds of wickedness inside them, of unsettling. They never, they never get um, uh, settled there. So anyway, we might pull up there. There's much that we should go on, and uh, we will probably go on in the next little bits. But I think it's important to note that these Joshua 3 tells you between the ark and the rest of the people coming across is about 2,000 cubits. He doesn't say exactly 2,000 cubits. It's about... So we don't know when the coming is. We don't know when the timing of the Lord is, but it's about 2,000 cubits. Then he says to Herod, which was never fulfilled, today I'm going to perform cures. Today and tomorrow I'm going to perform cures. I'm going to exercise demons. And then on the third day I'm going to be perfected. Well, his body will be perfected. We are the temple of God, is that right? And just so that you get the sequence right, we had the kids doing Joseph this morning, is that right? How wonderful. How wonderful. But before the exaltation of Joseph, what happened to him? He was incarcerated. And that's what will happen to you and I. And that's what's going on right now. Okay, we're going to have the same thing repeating itself. We are going to be exalted. We will sit and rule this planet. You think, I'm not capable. Well, you'll have to get up to speed, Joe, because you might be given the Philippines to rule. Who knows? But we're going to sit and we're going to publicly exercise the rulership of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean things that are way out of this world. It might, you might be involved in water purif purification. There was a man in London who, uh, the, some of you may, may have known if you've been there uh, maybe 40 years ago, the Thames in London was absolutely putrid. Fish were dying, they couldn't hold fish stocks, and there was a man whose job it was to try and re rehabilitate this, um, this river. And so he's got it to a stage now where they're actually the schools and they're seeing dolphins coming up the Thames, which they haven't seen in 50 years. And it was only when he heard a message about God's view on work, he said, finally, I know what my purpose is. He said, when Jesus comes back and the planet's going to be in disarray and then suddenly recreated, his job may be to purify the waters so that people can live. You will have duties of like the, like the bureaucrats do now. They come to you to hear what the wisdom of God is because Jesus will be sitting physically in Jerusalem. And so we begin to rule and reign with him. We are his arms and his feet in for that thousand years. Don't get too carried away after a thousand years. You just lay it all at his feet, eh? <laughs> Do a good job in those thousand years. But this is what we're destined for. All I want to tell you is why is today different? Today is different because prophecy tells us this is the time of his appearing. And so we need to get our lives in order. We need to have the ability to stand in a culture that is toxic, in a stream that the tide is pulling you out the other way. It, we are going to be walking. I remember one time on the Gold Coast, I was there um, with that couple, the camping couple that we went to, Thunder Eggs. And, um, and we got out, and I, I'd never, because we never had rips and stuff in New Guinea that I knew of. Anyway, you could, anywhere it's all pretty placid and all good like that. Anyway, we're down at the Gold Coast and literally I'm from here to the kitchen away from the shore. Not far. The water's up to here. But, mate, we spent two hours trying to get to the shore. The rip is against us. We couldn't get in. It was only, I was just about, he was just, a, he's a grown man. He's just about out of whack. And I was, I was down in my last attempt, you know what I mean? And I said, well, here we go. And we got in. Thank God for that. But that's what we're walking in now. The spirit of this age is coming totally. Everything is against what, your, what God is commanding you to do. And it, you're going to find yourself drained of every strength of all your natural resources are going to go because the tide is so, so big that only God can help us stand. Only God. It's not like we can say, well, I'm going to just lock myself in. This is how... No. We will give up. Our strength will go. We need the strength of God to keep us. If we're praying for anything, we should be praying that God keep us in this hour. Develop within us a steely 
attitude where we refuse to let go of the hand of God. And even where we've failed and we've fallen again, we say, God, I know I'm weak, but you are strong and I'm going to stand in you. I remember um, Solzhenitsyn, was it, that was in the gulag? And they said to him, uh, no, no, it's not him. The guy who wrote his little morning devotional went and taught in New York, Jewish guy. Well, he was a Messianic Jew anyway. He was in there and they said to him, what, you know, you must have a favourite scripture because he was locked up in this gulag for years. And they said, what scripture kept you in there? What was your favourite scripture? What was the thing that you locked onto when things got really bad that you just held onto that scripture? And he said, you know, at the start, the first three or four years, he said, that did hold me. You know, there were scriptures that I held on to and everything. But he says, the time comes where you abandon all hope. And it's all God. And the only thing that kept me was Jesus. There wasn't a word that he could say, this is the word that carried me through this. He'd just get up in the morning and say, Jesus, I just give my life to you. I don't know whether I'm going to get bashed in the yard today. I don't know whether I'm going to be raped in here or what's going to happen to me. But, um, or I'm going to get tortured and have my fingernails torn out by the guards or whatever. I don't know what's facing me today. But Jesus, I just put my life in your hands. And he survived to come out. It's only God that can keep us. It really is because in your natural things, you will give up easy. We need Jesus. We're a church that needs Jesus. If we're going to stand, it's only him. Don't get too full of what you know and what you think. Get to know Jesus. Hold his hand. Know his face and know his voice. His sheep hear his voice. And so this will be Sermon 1 in our starter back, Survival in Babylon. And so, like I said, I only do a couple of, couple of sermons that I think are vital so that we can know the difference of the tide that we're swimming in and what we need to do to stand. And so let's all stand and commit our lives to Jesus, shall we? Oh God, we come to you today and we say, Lord, we're so weak. But you said your strength is made perfect in weakness, not in strength. Your strength's not made perfect in strength, but your strength is made perfect in weakness. And God, you get the glory when we could not have done it on our own. Lord, that's where you get glory. You, Gideon's army, it's too big. Shave it down. It's too big. Shave it down. Oh, but have you seen what's against us? No, just shave it down. Why? Because it's an impossibility. But God, with you, all things are possible. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, keep us in this hour. Lord, for us parents, I'm asking you a special blessing. Keep our children. God, where we don't have the wherewithal, we're stupid, we're, we don't know what we're doing. Lord, and uh, God, you've entrusted them to us. So God, give us a special uh, blessing, Lord, that we know what your word says, what you are saying to us for our children. And they've all got their individual characters, Lord. God, guide us for our children that we want to, we, we say today, we want to bring up godly offspring, Lord, that are going to follow in your footsteps even in a culture where every friend may lead them astray, where every friend is trying to get them to um, take a stance on LGBTIQ, where every friend is trying to get them a, a stance on uh, who they are gender-wise, where every friend is, is trying to re-educate them in the, in the language of the Egyptians. But God, put within these children and put within our hearts how to train them so that they're able to stand. And like Moses, they'll say they'll endure the hardship of the Jew rather than the pleasures of the palace of the Egyptians. And God, help us, Lord, to stand that way, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Thank you.